All right, horror fans, I can't believe that as of me recording this video, I am mere days away from a brand new Scream movie being released. And even though the studio decided not to call it Scream 5, you and I both know in our hearts, this is Scream 5. Continuing the legacy that Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson started back in 1996, Gail Weathers, Sidney Prescott, Do Riley, all returning. This is a movie that's promising to honor the legacy while embracing the future for what is to come. One could say, I'm feeling woozy here! So I thought what better way to go ahead and celebrate the fact that we're getting a brand new Scream movie than to go through each one of the four previous Scream films, reviewing them shot by shot, telling you exactly why I consider the Scream franchise to be one of my favorite series of all time, specifically mentioning the things I love that the series did, while also even talking about some of its missteps that I wasn't so fond of. But whatever they might be, I still want to remind you guys they're just my opinions. This isn't no video essay or me trying to dissect the Scream franchise and figure out what made it so meta. No, I'm just going to be poking fun about these movies I love and talking about them with you guys. So that's what I definitely need to know from you guys. What was your experience when watching Scream of 1996? Do you remember the first time you saw the movie? Did you fall in love with them right away? Did it take a couple of the sequels for you to get into them? Or maybe are you someone who doesn't like this series? I'd also be happy to hear from you guys and let me know is you crazy? So like I was saying, what can I say about the Scream franchise that hasn't already been talked about? We all know that when Scream of 1996 dropped, it basically reinvented the horror genre. Due to its popularity and success, Scream basically started a new era for horror. Not only did it revive the slasher genre for a moment because it was just dying from the countless crazy cheesy sequels, it also basically showed that there was a lot more interesting things you could do with a horror movie than just killing off people. There was great commentary on horror movies, our society in general, and also you can have fun. But enough of me blabbing on, let's just go ahead and hit play with Scream from 1996. But after that great and creepy title card opening, we're introduced to one of my favorite traditions about the Scream franchise, the opening kill. We have here Casey, Drew Barrymore's character who's a high school student making some popcorn about to watch a movie until she gets a call from a stranger. Hello? Hello? Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? What number is this? What number are you trying to reach? I don't know. Well, I think you have the wrong number. The thing I love the most about these first 10 minutes in the Scream movie is not only that it's like a perfect little horror short film, but just how quickly things go from being innocent, comforting, you're in your home, you're making popcorn about to watch a movie, and then in the span of 10 minutes, things get so dark and horrifying that you'll end up dead. It's such a great appetizer for the movie you're about to watch, and it's also a great introduction to Ghostface himself, because come on, let's face it, Roger L. Jackson's voice as Ghostface is not only one of the coolest, but sexiest things to happen to the Scream franchise. Hello. Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> you like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? This man's voice was so seductive that he got the character of Casey to basically cheat on her boyfriend Steve before looking at this man's face. So, you got a boyfriend? <laughs> Why? You want to ask me out on a date? Maybe. Do you have a boyfriend? No. Casey, I don't know what to tell you, but this is what he looks like. Yo, that voice is sexy enough for me. I'll do it. He's also the voice of Mojo Jojo, so that's a bonus for me. The last thing I want to say about this opening kill before we move on is just how graphic and gory it is. I think when you think about the Scream franchise, you don't really think about how gory it is. You think about gory when maybe talking about the Saw franchise or Hostel. But that really just goes to Wes Craven's directing style and the way that he can make gore look tasteful. After the ending of the opening kill, we open up on our main character of the franchise, or I should say the queen, Sydney Prescott. Honestly, I could go the entire video on why I love Nev Campbell's portrayal of Sidney Prescott, but she is one of the things that has carried this franchise all throughout the films, and it wouldn't feel like a Scream movie without her being involved one way, shape, or form. It's also just one of the things I feel that has made this series feel so personal and connected, because most horror franchises, whether you're talking about Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Child's Play, or whatnot, they always seem to recycle in and out a main character where there's never really a consistency, and with Scream, you can basically always rely on Sidney Sydney Prescott being there to be chased by Ghostface. But it's not the only main character we're introduced in this sequence because we also get to meet Billy Loomis, who I gotta say, yeah, the dude looks like he would obviously be the serial killer. I mean, just look at that bad boy haircut. Wish, wish I could do that with my hair. 
One thing about Billy Loomis's character that was interesting in this scene is that he talked in movies, which actually a lot of the characters in the Scream movies talk in movies. Tom. No, I was home watching television. The, uh, the Exorcist was on. It got me thinking of you. It did? Yeah, it was edited for TV. You know, all the good stuff was cut out. It's one of the things that some people might find annoying today where they're just constantly referencing different horror movies because, well, we're watching a horror movie and this is supposed to be a commentary on horror films. But in a weird way, it's a language I understand and like. You're going to compare something to a movie that I've seen? I'll most likely understand what you're trying to tell me. I was watching Shrek last night and uh, it got me thinking about us because uh, ogres have layers and you like onions. Um, second movie is the best one, right? And I guess in speaking of horror movies, one thing I really didn't pay attention to as a kid when I first watched this franchise until later on is just how much the first Scream movie loves paying homage to the original Halloween of 1978. You have Billy Loomis here who has gifted the last name of Dr. Loomis, one of the main characters of the original Halloween. Pair that up with a sprinkle of references throughout the film. Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters? Name the killer in Halloween. Michael. Michael. <laughs> yes! Get in the car. Drive down to the Mackenzie's. I want you to go down the stairs and out the front door. And I want you to go down the street to the Mackenzie's house. The killer's still out there. But don't go there, Sam. You're starting to sound like some West Carpenter flick or something. To where even in the finale, they get away with using the iconic John Carpenter music of Halloween for their final act. <laughs> it's a nice way of paying respects to the slasher genre with the horror film that reinvented it with a tradition that's still being kept up to date in the new movies because the two new main characters, Sam and Tara, are last named Carpenter after John Carpenter from Halloween. But quickly the next day, our main characters are going into Woodsboro High where the mayhem of everyone finding out that a couple of students have been murdered. It's here even where the movie starts dropping some clues to the backstory involved with Sidney Prescott's character. I mean, Dulu's saying this is the worst crime we've seen in years, even worse than... Who's up next? Uh, Sydney Prescott. Prescott. She was daughter of... Uh... <clears throat> and that's one thing the Scream movies do in particular, but the first Scream movie did it the best, is the dropping of clues, the hinting to a larger story, a puzzle piece that would be all put together by the end of the film. Little things like when the principal touches the face of Sydney Prescott and the officer thinks that's a little odd. Or even deeper cuts later in the movie, like when they spend a whole sequence kind of focusing in on the shoes of Ghostface in this bathroom, to then scenes later they show you the shoes of the sheriff with some creepy music attached. Shoes are important in the Scream franchise. Don't forget the biggest hint of all, Randy's shoes being green, letting us know one day he'd star in Son of the Mask. But jokes aside, even in rewatchability of this movie, knowing who the killers are by the end, I don't think it really takes away from all the subtle clues. If anything, I think it kind of enhances your ability because now you're watching the two killers' movements at every turn, like here when they're at the water fountain and Sydney is curious about how does someone even gut somebody, and the great Matthew Lillard starts going into detail about how to do it where you can see Billy's face kind of going shut your Scooby-Doo ass up you're gonna give us away man well really who could guess that this man would be one of the killers when he makes jokes like this better live her alone <laughs> live her alone I would have been friends with you in high school, man. After that long day, Sydney's finally dropped off in front of her house where I'm like, damn, everybody in Woodsboro just be rich. I mean, look at this damn patio. There's six chairs there, and for all we know, two people live in this house with Sydney, her and her father. What are all these chairs for? No wonder Ghostface jealous. We then see Sydney Prescott ending up taking a nap, waiting for her friend to arrive, Tatum, who really isn't the most sensitive character about these deaths. It's past seven. Don't worry. Casey and Steve didn't bite it till way after 10. But at least she's got her priorities straight, cause... I'm gonna swing by the video store. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. Oh wait, what? But in waiting for her friend, Sydney does receive a call from Ghostface. And this is where the movie just starts to show you Sydney Prescott is not your typical victim. I like the way she starts toying with Ghostface, and even though a couple of her high school classmates have died by a killer, she's not afraid to taunt or question that this is the killer on the other line, having a little fun with him. Can you see me right now? Ah, uh, okay. 
What am I doing? Huh? What am I doing? Hello? Of course, Sydney Prescott quickly finds out this wasn't a game. Getting attacked by Ghostface and ending up becoming the cliche she swore she hated. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Going up to her room, closing the door, and dialing 911 on her computer, which I did not know was a thing you could do in the 90s. But just as soon as she calls for them, Ghostface disappears, and Billy, her boyfriend, shows up at the window. Something that we know by now is very very convenient timing, even more suspicious that he drops a cellular device in the middle of their hug. Setting alarms off in Sydney's head, she decides to run off downstairs where she bumps in to Dewey Riley. Thankfully though, dialing the police on a computer is the fastest way to reach them because they got there in record time, I kid you not. It was like less than a minute since Sydney went ahead and called for the police and a squad is already outside her house. Ain't no way I'm ever calling 911, I'm tweeting at them. And I think here's where the movie just plays it so brilliantly with messing with your mind on who could be the killer because the obvious suspect that we would have is Billy Loomis from his appearance alone and the movie goes ahead and tries to make it as obvious as possible that it is him but because of reverse psychology and watching a movie the most obvious answer is usually not the real answer but in this recent attack with Ghostface it is where the police get a better understanding on the killer because they found the costume left at the crime scene and here's where I want to talk about that it is so awesome that they picked a real world outfit that existed before this movie. You guys who have followed my channel and watched me talk about horror films, you know one of my biggest pet peeves with today's slashers is that most horror movies do not want to go ahead and give us creative killer costumes. They all just want to give us the simple black hoodie and random mask. I hate that horror movie trope to death where I'm like, what the heck happened to the days of a hockey mask with a green button up or a red and green sweater? Heck, even some blue coveralls with a white mask. Why does every horror movie nowadays need to be a black hoodie with some random lame mask? But Ghostface in the Scream franchise to me is the only exception to that hatred because I think he makes the simplicity of a black robe and white mask works so well. I like how it has this sort of flimsy feel when he's running. I don't know what it is about the ghost face mask, but I think it's the fact that I can't make out what expression is exactly going on in that mask, whether it's someone happy, smiling, laughing, or being creepy. It's just such a cool look. This leads us into the events of the next day where they really basically set up the lore for Scream that would be the basis for all the other killers to come in future sequels, and that's the backstory of Sydney's mom here. Throughout the film, we get a lot of different takes on who exactly Sydney's mother was. Of course, to Sydney, she was just a loving mother who was a good wife to her father until one day she was murdered. Sydney happening to have witnessed the situation a year ago and pinpointing Cotton Weary as the murderer who is currently sentenced to the death penalty based on her conviction. We find out here that Sydney is actually not a big fan of Gail Weathers because she wrote a book on the events of Sydney's mother's death. Death, where in Gail's book she implies that Sydney misidentified the killer and that her mother was a little promiscuous having many lovers outside of her father. I think this is a great dynamic for the characters of Sydney and Gail and especially as you see them throughout the franchise and how their relationship has changed. Rewatching this movie it reminds me that in the beginning I hated the Gail Weathers character and it's so crazy that over time I grew to really like her. An innocent man on death row. A killer still on the loose. Kenny tell me I'm dreaming. You want to go live? No, no, no. If I'm right about this, I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? Bringing us inside the school, Sydney is confronted with Billy, who has now been released from prison because his cell phone records show that he never tried calling Sydney or anyone else who had been murdered. But in this conversation, Billy does tell Sydney to get over her mother's death because, well, he lost a mother too, who abandoned his family. This is not the same thing. Your mom left town. She's not lying in a coffin somewhere. Sydney leaving that conversation, heading off into the bathroom, we get something that will stay with the Scream franchise outside of the movies for every single sequel to come. The explanation that Sydney should be Ghostface. What if Sydney killed Casey and Steve? Why would she do that? Maybe she's a slut just like her Mother. Here you basically have this amazing actress who does not get enough credit for the little time she's on screen letting us know a little bit more about what the town thought of Sydney's mother and why because of all this it sets up a motive for Sydney to be Ghostface and the actual killer around town. And that's not even the scariest thing she does. Sticks her finger in her hand before she washes it. You just use the bathroom cochina. I don't know about you guys but if this channel was called Dead Meat and I was doing a kill count 
I'd consider that a kill right there. Death by staff infection. But back to what I was mentioning, the thing that would stick with the Scream franchise with every damn sequel that involves Sidney Prescott is every time there was a new Scream movie, you will have a large group of fans that will come out and say, Sidney should be Ghostface. Sidney should be the killer. To where it'll even be continually brought up and Sidney will continue to be framed as Ghostface all throughout the series that you really think it would be such a great twist if it happened now? So in summary, when Scream 6 is being made and you hit me with Sidney's the killer, Saskia, I'm the killer of your life. But speaking of kills, we move over here to the principal of the school who just went ahead and expelled two students for wearing a ghost face mask throughout the halls, only for us to see this hypocrite trying that mask on himself. And I think it's a great little sequence here of the principal being taunted with someone knocking at his door and him going out to investigate to where we get a little Nightmare on Elm Street reference with Wes Craven playing a janitor dressed as Freddy Krueger I love to see it. Having the principal come back to his office only for Ghostface to pop out behind him and stab him, leading to a great visual involving the principal's eyeball. But with these killings going around, the town of Woodsboro has issued a curfew, but that's not going to stop the teens of this town from partying. But before the party, I think it's so funny that you have Ghostface stalking Sydney and Tatum throughout the town. You just see Ghostface out in the bushes staring, walking by. Or when they head off to the grocery store for snacks for the party later tonight, you could see the reflection of Ghostface in costume, in broad daylight, in a store. I have to imagine there was a store employee or a customer that saw Ghostface just lurking around and thought, what the hell? Bringing us to a scene where we find Randy working at a video store, a site I love to see because I miss me my video stores, where again, we have our characters talking in movies, a language I understand. If they'd watch Palm Night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect. But also, any scene involving Matthew Lillard doing what he does best as Stu is a scene I'm going to eat up. Now that Billy tried to mutilate her, do you think Sid would go out with me? <laughs> no, I don't at all. But it's also a great sympathizing piece for the character of Randy here, who is the underrated character of Scream. I love how knowledgeable the character is and the way he is basically speaking for the audience, but how terrifying for him that he was literally sandwiched by the two killers of this movie without even realizing it. That's what I think about when re-watching this scene is just how the two killers right here are pouncing on Randy and the way they're kind of cornering Randy really mirrors the way they eventually corner Sydney at the end of this movie. But before we get to the party at hand, we have the movie here giving us our prime chief suspect, and that is Sydney's father. Those calls are listed to Neil Prescott, Sydney's father. Guess what tomorrow is? The anniversary of his wife's death. Finally bringing us to the big party in the third act of Scream that everyone is in attendance for. And with this many bodies around, Ghostface is sure to be having some fun. Starting off with the character of Tatum, who I think is looking pretty cold right now. You all right there, Tatum? I'm not looking, they looked at me. Tatum entering the garage, hoping to get a couple of beers for her boyfriend, now realizing in rewatch that it was a trap that Stu started all along, because the boy just seems to love killing his girlfriends. Why? There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. Good point, Randy. But it's a sequence I really like because it just goes to show you that Tatum was a character that did not care at all about Ghostface. She had no sympathy for any of the victims that were killed, and even though the man is right in front of her, she is still having some fun. Lose the outfit. If Sydney sees it, she'll flip. Oh, you want to play psycho killer? Can I be the helpless victim? No, please don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I want to be in the sequel. It's also in this scene and lighting that we get a better look at Glittery Ghostface, which I am a fan of. Not just that, but this scene is also a perfect example of the goofiness that is involved with Ghostface that I'm sure was a risky thing to include in this movie. Because all throughout the film, we have seen that this Ghostface is obviously human, because throughout the movie, we've seen that this Ghostface has tripped, been beaten, kicked, and in this garage sequence, he takes the biggest beating. And that really, to me, just adds more of a terrifying factor to Ghostface, even though sometimes the logistics involved with this movie don't make all that much sense. Like a woman thinking that she can squeeze through a cat door? Just like it wouldn't be possible for any garage door to hold the weight of a human being. You want to know how I know? Because this damn movie got me in trouble. I saw the movie as a kid and I thought garage doors were that strong where they can hold up a person. So one day when my dad was opening the garage door and I was nine years old as it was going up, I decided to hang on thinking it would give me a little wee ride. 
and I broke my garage door and cost my parents hundreds of dollars. Ooh, I felt the ghost face beaten that day. But it's not long after Tatum's death that the party starts to end because of the curfew on Woodsboro, entering in Billy Loomis, who Sydney decides they need to go upstairs and have a talk. And this is where Sydney tries to go ahead and put the past behind her, move forward with her boyfriend, and some dialogue that might come off cheesy today, but I don't know why. For me, it really hits and I like it. This isn't a movie. Sure it is, Sid. It's all, it's all a movie. It's all one great big movie. As that adult movie is starting to begin upstairs, we cut back downstairs to where Randy is going ahead and explaining to some of the newbies the rules of a horror movie. Why don't you? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. Another iconic thing that the Scream franchise is known for is establishing rules for each one of its sequels. And I love how after each one of these rules is being said, you immediately start thinking back to some of your older favorite horror movies of that time and going, Oh crap, that is true. When this person did this and then did this, they would end up dead. It just further goes to show you the great commentary that Scream is and being spot on with things while also still following the rules that it is setting up and breaking a few of them. We then cut to Gail Weathers and her cameraman who have been spying on the kids at the party with the camera they planted in the house where Dewey interrupts them informing Gail that he got a call about a suspicious car down the road and if she would like to come with him. As those two future lovebirds head off, we come back to the kids inside of Stu's house where they find out the fate of the principal from their school. They found Principal Henry dead. He was gutted and hung from the goalpost on the football field. Let's go over there before they pry him down! Here's where Dewey and Gail then come in contact with the car for Sydney's father, making it extremely obvious now that he is most likely the killer of the movie, setting things in motion for the finale, and just to reassure the audience that they don't still think it's Billy Loomis, they go ahead and get rid of him. Sending Sydney running across the Stu house until she lands, on a boat. With Sydney escaping, we cut to what I think is my favorite meta Easter egg joke of the entire movie is Randy, played by Jamie Kennedy, who is talking to his TV as he's watching Halloween, speaking to Jamie Lee Curtis, but at the same time is also speaking to himself because his name in real life is Jamie. Oh, there he is. I told you. I told you he's right around the corner. Jamie. Look behind. I'll turn up. Behind you. Behind Jamie. This movie does so many clever things, but for some reason, I feel like that's the cleverest thing they've ever done. And really, this is just where you have endless amount of chaos starting to happen in the movie. Gail realizing that the killer is nearby and having to escape only for her cameraman to be on top of her car. Us finding out then that Dewey Riley gets stabbed in the back by Ghostface. Having Sydney take shelter inside the cop car where we got some really nice taste of Ghostface's personality with him taunting her with the keys. Sydney does manage to get away and since we still don't know the identity of Ghostface at this time, it's a great showcase of how Sydney just cannot trust the people around her. Sydney locking herself in Stu's house, Billy coming down from the stairs, bringing us to the reveal of who the killer actually is. Stu's flipped out. He's gone mad. We all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> no, Billy! And I'll just say it, every minute from now on in this movie until the credits roll, I am in absolute bliss. The finale for the first Scream movie is probably my favorite finale of any movie of all time. The shift in personality that Billy Loomis and Stu have here now fully realized as the killers explaining their plan to Sydney, showing off a bit of their chemistry and relationship. It's a fun game, Sydney. See, we ask you a question and if you get it wrong, book it out! I wouldn't believe how easy he was to frame. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> it was fun. We did your mom a favor, Sid. That woman was a slut bag whore who flashed her shit all over town like she was Sharon Stone. Because let's face it, Sydney, your mother was no Sharon Stone. These two guys made being a serial killer 
look freaking cool. I can't be the only one watching these two having the time of their lives. Matthew Lillard basically giving the performance of his lifetime. No joke. The man seriously should have won an Oscar for this. I'm not kidding. But taking a pause on just how much I'm loving the performances and the reveal of these characters, the actual motives themselves of Billy going after Sydney because it was her mother that basically had an affair with his father, broke up his family, and that's the reason he's doing what he's doing. I think is a great explanation. There was plenty of clues throughout the movie for you to piece that together and I feel like it does go outside the box to have the main character's mother be sort of this tainted person. Usually the mother in horror movies is a good person, especially if there was someone that was murdered. You really wouldn't think of them this way and it also just kind of changes Sydney's mind on her own family. Pair that up with the way they're gonna blame Sydney's father as the killer for these murders and them wanting to go ahead and make a sequel? You see, Sid, everybody dies, but us, everybody dies. We're gonna carry on playing the sequel, because let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. I'm low-key curious to see that someday in the Scream franchise. How about we have a Scream movie where the killers win and we get to see what their version of the sequel is. But the part that probably shocked me the most on first viewing and still does to this day is the out of the box thinking that these guys do to harm themselves in order to make it look like they're victims. This is where I was like, all right, you guys were cool. I wanted to be you. I don't think I'd be able to do that. That is just insanity to another level, but I also feel is very clever. No one is gonna suspect the people who have stab wounds and are bleeding to death as the killers. But now with their plan all laid out, all that's left to do is to kill off Sydney, having Stu go off to get the gun. Enter in Gail Weathers, who's still alive, and Stu still having the best lines of this damn movie. Man, I thought she was dead. She looked dead, man. Still does. Sadly, not making much of a difference as she had the safety on that gun. Sydney taking this opportunity to flee and call the police where even though I mentioned earlier that these movies will continue to frame and try and blame Sydney as Ghostface, at the end of these screen movies, Sydney basically does become Ghostface. She calls them up using the voice changer. Hello? Are you alone in the house? You bitch, where the fuck are you? Not so fast. We're gonna play a little game. She even eventually wears the outfit. It's great stuff, but not as great as these damn stew one-liners, man. Fuck. Should I let the machine get it? Can't, Billy. How are you coming, dude? I think I'm dying here, man. Oh, stew, stew, stew. What's your motive? Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. Mama's boy. Fuck. Oh, fucking hit me with the phone, dick. Did you really call the police? Sorry, ass. I... My mom and dad are be so bad. Funniest freaking man on earth, Matthew Lillard. I love you. Stu finding that one last scare energy in him decides to tackle Sydney, wrestling to the ground, admitting his love for her because every killer just seems to have a thing for Sydney. I always had a thing for you, Sid. But Sydney getting the upper hand and killing Stu with the TV. And I'm gonna say it, man. I hope the brother's still alive, okay? We see he's slightly still breathing here. If there is at all a possibility Stu can show up and scream five, please do it. But just like Stu had that one last scare energy in him, so did Billy Loomis. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life. For one last scare. Look, the first Scream movie could have easily have been a one and done movie, a classic masterpiece where they had one film that was a commentary on the genre at that time, revived it, but they decided not to do that and continue making several sequels where they will play on this formula and continue to commentate on horror at that time. And you know what? Even though I think none of the sequels other than one of them compares to this first Scream movie, I love the way this series plays out. The mystery at hand where you always Always trying to figure out Ghostface and even if the reveal at the end isn't as satisfying the fact that you get to carry on with these group of characters that some die off some stay on it makes for a great personalized watch and they find a way to build this world out and add some more lore and what we'll definitely explore in Scream 2. Don't forget to stay tuned for the next review but as always I'm Chris take care.